Sharon Katz. Born in racist South Africa, who seem to have missed it all. She was too hungry for the truth at the wrong time. She was too passionate about humanity. Well, I'm Sharon Katz and I direct this project that's become known as The Peace Train, which is a band, it's a musical production, it's a story. It's an honor that I find myself in that position. Growing up in South Africa, it was uh, the legacy of the brutal apartheid government that divided all people by race. People were forced to live in separated areas, geographic areas, white areas for whites only, black areas, that was the majority of course. In black areas or black townships where conditions were really, really bad for many people. Colored areas for biracial people, Indian areas for Indian people. A street separated the township and the so called town where white people lived. And yet you could live in South Africa and blame it on not knowing. You could live in South Africa and accept the conspiracy of silence on both sides. From the moment that I could really think for myself and see what was going on, it became an upbringing or a childhood of, of great pain and conflict. Thinking that I wanted to run away and join the underground and fight against the government. Africa! 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 Tremendous amount of conflict. And we needed at that time to mobilize all the people of South Africa to cross that line, to create a society that would be the future rainbow nation. And people like Sharon Katz, people who were involved in the Black Sesh, people like Bishop Tutu, people, I mean, like Nelson Mandela, these are the people 
that show the government that you don't actually represent us. But I remember as a young child, we, we would drive the whole road from Port Elizabeth to Durban. It was, it was a two-day trip. We would drive through the Transkei, which was called the Transkei at that time. That was your picture of African countryside with huts and women carrying water on their heads down to the river and tremendous poverty. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, why is this? These people are so poor. And yet the city that I come from, Port Elizabeth, the modern city, the suburb, people seem to be living okay, but this is still my country. You know, I just remember those feelings, passionate feelings of just looking wistfully out of the window and wondering, is this my country? Is this my South Africa? I, I just felt that it was a foreign country, but I knew it wasn't. I knew it was my country as well. Can you imagine being restricted with your life? You are being told how to live your life. You are being told who to talk to and not to talk to. It brought a lot of people down. It killed, in fact, a lot of people. That feeling really destroyed a lot of people. And the ones that were not destroyed became stronger. <laughs> Somehow, sometime, life does it. It puts you in front of another kindred spirit. You connect, and you never lose that connection. My friendship with Sharon, she's just a good spirit. And we need more of them in order to make this world a better place for all. I was 51, 51, when I voted for the first time in my life on the 27th of April. Therefore, I remember 51 years of apartheid. The hurt that was inflicted on the black communities of South Africa by the government that happened to be the shade of color I am was just unspeakable, unspeakable. Most of the things that happened during the time, although now and then with a little tear in your eye, but you still managed to laugh and say, but why was that? And the very, even the very people that orchestrated it cannot understand. They don't know why they did it. They themselves are sorry. They themselves have no reason why they did what they did. Mr. Prinslow, what is the basic philosophy underlying apartheid as a way of life? We Europeans who have lived in this country for more than 300 years have come to a conclusion which is strange to some people in the Western world. The African people are realizing that apartheid means nothing else but oppression and exploitation. To them. We all grew up in a prison of sorts. South Africa was a prison for everybody. We shared a common vision. We could see beyond apartheid. We could see that the apartheid state was mounted on the feet of clay. And all it needed was all of us to push at the same time and it would crumble. I couldn't push from the black side only. I needed Sharon to put on the other side. <laughs> Well, at this time I was about 15 years old when I saw the play The Just, an Apple Few God performance. It was hush hush and underground and we would have all been arrested. The play was so powerful. I was riveted. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And in this play was John Carney, who became very famous, 
Winston Shawna, who together with John also, they became very famous on Broadway and West End London. And they stand up, all of them with their fists singing, Go see, see, Kelele, Africa, our national anthem. And I was moved to tears. And, and I remember standing up and raising my fist. And, you know, it was my awakening. I ran up to the actors after the show and I said, I have to know you. I have to be with you. I've got to spend time with you. We were hardcore revolutionaries. We were not just actors. We were also members of the underground movement. And they would hide me at the back of the car because it was strictly illegal to go to a township. Cover me with a blanket and then after we put, passed the police barriers, they'd say, okay, you can come up now. And then I knew we had passed the police booms, barriers, and they'd normally ask people for their pass, which were these horrible things that people had to carry, black people had to carry a pass, showing where they lived and how long they were allowed to be in a white area. And then we would go into a hall and I would watch them rehearsing. And every time they showed up, it became a situation, and what's this white girl doing? And I remember my younger brother, who was a hard, hardcore, used to say, you're getting close to these people. You are going to forget the revolution. What's going to happen when we have to kill these white people? You're going to give us a list of people you know that you can't kill at all, you can't kill Sharon Katz. And she was a kid. She didn't understand that we were actually terrorists. <laughs> you know, she thought we were good guys. We weren't good guys. So we protected her first from the truth of who we are. Then we protected her every time she crossed the line and came into the black townships. It was an eye-opener for me. I was like, wow, you know, this is how people are living. And it changed me forever. And I used to go and sing with people. It was always about music for me. Somehow or other, I was always in the thick of it with my music and my guitar. Free spirit and just happy. It was. She was white but black inside. <laughs> the music was my way of connecting on a heart level. <laughs> and I had the opportunity to study in America, to study music therapy, which was my chosen profession. And I was, I was really fortunate to, to be able to pursue that because there was nowhere in South Africa to study this. I had to come to America. And that's where I met Marilyn. Really, it was Marilyn that said to me, Mandela's free. You need to do your work in South Africa. And we both did what we needed to do to just pack up and get ourselves back to South Africa at a time when things were really changing. And welcome again to our Durban Arts Midweek Concert. Brilliant pair of performers, and it's over to Sharon and Mandela. I remember that first time I saw you perform in Durban. It was on the steps of the City Hall. You know, those free lunchtime concerts, one of the few times that people could hear music who weren't earning a decent wage at that time. You started to play a kind of Maskanda song and, and sing in Zulu. And the place erupted. I, I could still feel, you know, because people were just so happy that somebody was respecting and honoring their language and, and their culture. It was 1992, but we hadn't had elections yet. There was no date even for the elections. A young man there, a musician, he said, I want you to meet my friend. And he took me to meet Nontlantla Wanda. My name is Nontlantla, which means fortunate. Originally, we came from Umbumbulu. Umbumbulu is a place which is it's an outskirt town, uh, where in rural areas, in fact, uh, where my father grew up.
when I met Sharon, I was teaching in, in Abambo. It's a rural area, that place, and it's very, very rural. Sharon was willing to come to our location and yet white people never thought of doing that in those days. I was so amazed to meet a uh, just literally a white white girl uh, talking with a black girl and then I said my god is it happening we were segregated and by that time it was very difficult for a black person to accept a white person because politics uh, was in a, a very high level and it was during the time of apartheid. I, I told myself that let me try and see that we can build trust with Sharon. Can you just teach them? Because I think they are used to what we want. All right. We want to be happy. When voices me. Through music, it happened. We became lifelong friends and we started the Peace Train project. Myself, Nontlantla and Marilyn. And what I liked by that time, the mission and the vision that she had, I had the same thing. It wasn't just fighting for freedom, you have to carry uh, AK-47, but also with your mind. a chance to mount what they said was a big choir and I said yeah I'm there when you said you wanted to do a big choir I thought well yeah okay you know I could help you to do that I thought, hmm. big choir 30 40 50 people when you said 500 I almost fell on the ground she was like what I said 500 we really need to do this you know in a big way we need to make a a big noise. We need to, to get all these voices together to sing together, and it still wasn't called the Peace Train. We called that When Voices Meet. When the voices meet, when the people meet, all that apartheid had tried to do would come undone because it was so abnormal. We really needed a vehicle after several months of wearing our shoes out completely, right? <laughs> Holes in my soles. <laughs> we provided a truck. I think we tried to give some confidence to get on with it, and that's basically what we did. If you can do something for other people, you should do it. You should try. It's called Tikkun. It's a crazy, 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 crazy and then we just sat back and watched. They both appealed to me, you know, I thought here were two young girls who were trying to devote their lives to something which 
was only for the good of a community and not for themselves. And that's what struck the chord. Anybody want to give any messages to their mothers, right? <laughs> it took about three months, I think, of rehearsing the choirs in all of their separated areas because the school systems were still separated then, people were still living separated. to get up at five o'clock in the morning and drive to Umlazi Township. We had white people coming to our school, teaching us these songs, uh, dancing, uh, playing around with the guitar, and it was something new for us, you know. We were all excited, the whole school was buzzing. We got uh, white people in our premises. We were told that they were gonna teach us some songs and we go to sing with other white kids, colored kids, Indian kids and they were teaching us some of the songs and we felt that, no, these songs were not appropriate for white people, you know, to say that Africa is coming back, you know, Africa, my, my boy, my boy, Africa. Those songs were sung by black people back in those days. Now we were told that the white people, the Mlumus, were going to sing the same song and we said, no, let's wait and see. And then it says, Maibuye, Africa, means we are coming back, Africa. Maibuye, can you say that? Maibuye. That's right. The, the first white people that I actually sat with, you know, um, it was back in 1992, it was Sharon Carter and Marilyn Cohen, you know. It was exciting times for us, but it was uh, a strange thing, you know. And we realized that they were just like us. They were smiling, they were eating the same food as us, and they could sing, well, they could try to dance. <laughs> now, I want to talk about being forced to dance. <laughs> It was terrible. I used to fight with that choreographer. He would look at me and go, uh-uh. This woman should not be near here. I was terrible. I would come home so frustrated. I'd be like, you can't believe it. They want me to do this. I can't even move. You hold your Africa until it starts coming again, OK? I went to a girls' school that was predominantly white. And I think that held me back in certain areas. Okay, do you like it? Yes. It's going to be great with all the instruments And the only time I could ever be myself was when I was with a choir. Because those people didn't judge me for being this white girl. Because all of a sudden I am breaking boundaries and not fitting into the norm. You see, people don't like difference and I was behaving differently to the girls that I went to school with. They weren't hanging around with black kids and colored children. I was, on a weekend and holidays, that's all I did. When we did what we did, it was groundbreaking and it was um, out of the box. The timing was perfect, you know. There was this changing tide, change in thought that was slowly, it was slowly turning. My family came down with the indentured laborers back in the 1860s. So I'm a fourth generation Indian in South Africa. It's time for changing and rearranging. Yes. They, they had us so sheltered that we, we didn't really know the extent of apartheid. They kept us within certain boundaries. They kept us within certain strictures. We were never in a situation where we questioned. We never really realized the extent of the damage that was being done to our country. It was really a privilege for me, you know, having started off as an ordinary teacher, actually one of the lowest qualified teachers, 
not having any musical qualifications as such, but having musical knowledge, I never thought I'd get anywhere. So for me, getting involved was a very big honor. I realized that there was a sense of purpose as a colored person in South Africa. Growing up as a colored child in South Africa was very difficult. We always called ourselves the filling in the sandwich. We were neither out here nor there. We were just somewhere in the middle. It was three months, I think, of rehearsing in all of those separated communities before we finally got somebody to give us money to hire some buses and bring everybody together for the first time. You rented the city hall. I just remember us standing at that door thinking, what on earth is this? So many people of different colors in the same place at the same time. And then we got to City Hall and suddenly there was not just one of us, there was so many, like 500 of us in one go. We got divided according to our voices and we met people from other schools. It was frightening because it was something that we didn't know. It was mixing with people that we didn't know, who we, we had reservations about them, and I'm sure they had reservations about us, but it didn't matter. Just meeting so many different people and hearing stories that that are so sad. And yet, here are these people smiling in front of you, singing and dancing, and they didn't allow that pain to keep them down. We used to always ask, why is there whites only on this bench next to City Hall or wherever? Because we were not allowed to sit there, or we were not allowed to go there. So they said to me, Mom, you have to see this. And then I said, okay, let me park the car and come in with you. And it was absolutely lovely because I think we all of us got up and we were dancing. I, I can only imagine how beautiful it must have looked, you know, sitting in the audience and, and watching these kids in all their different school uniforms. You know, living their daily lives, having this moment in history that most kids at that time would never even imagine. Obviously, as we were growing, we were not exposed to white people. So as I was like, really, this woman, why is she having passion for black, for black people? Why is she bothering herself? But that's who she is. She's got that, that, that heart for everybody to unite people, to bring everybody uh, together. on this rock star status because here she was, this woman, commanding a 500-piece um, choir. I couldn't understand what this white lady was doing with all of us. What was she trying to do with all of us? And why were we so happily following her? 
And, and again, I'll go with instinct and say that we knew that she was trying to do something good, something big, something important. Music does do that. Music has a, an ability to, it transcends everything and it gives everybody a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, being on an equal footing and a sense of acceptance. From the early days, I can recall when Sharon came to um, our primary school. It wasn't just about being part of a choir or going on trips, but we realized that it was we spreading our message via music. When I joined the Peace Train, it was a matter of meeting all these different members and seeing how they conducted themselves. They were very free. They felt safe. Me, what me, uh, myself watching this and looking at everybody, there was nothing for me to be afraid of. I learned from that. I learned how to speak up for myself. And I've learned to be tolerant to, which at the end of the day, we are all the same. We are human beings, so we might be having differences, but we need to tolerate each other and understand what is important to understand and respect other people's cultures. It was something that I would have never even thought of, or a lot of people didn't even think of it. And we, here we were, the youngest people in the group that were a part of something so great. And on the night of that event, I'm thinking, everybody is saying to you, nobody's going to come, Sharon. The country's not ready for this yet. We're about an hour before the curtains are supposed to open and people are lining the block, all the way around the block, standing, waiting to come in. Even King Goodwill's Wellatini came. to know that this whole event would be completely impossible without the support and the dedication and the help of the families and the schools from, of all the children. Thank you, everybody. started coming in from around the country. You know, other places wanted it. I think somebody was just interviewing you. What I'd like to do is to take them on a train. And we've been thinking about calling it the peace train. And I knew I better start figuring out how am I going to fundraise <laughs> to be able to hire a train. The children of Durban have come together. They have also worked together. 
in unity of purpose to achieve harmony in their music and in their relationship with each other. Thank you. This is a very, very happy day for me personally and I think for all the children here and for all of you that are here to share this day with us. We are so happy that you came out today. You're in 2B. Okay? Do you get your hat and get changed into things so that you can go upstairs? We need this in our land. I fell in love with uh, Sharon, Meryl and the 500 children the moment I saw them at the City Hall. It was literally love at first sight. I'm going as far as Merritt's book. And you're in our compartment. You have teachers. For me. Okay, thank you. This young lady He's here, I can't seem to find a name She's with two children. I can remember a few months ago, we listened to you singing at the Durban City Hall. And those of you who were here, I've never, never seen anything more dramatic than that. I'm very, very happy to introduce to you my very, very good friends who have literally just stepped off the aeroplane. They've been in Norway, in Oslo, performing for Mr. Mandela and President de Klerk at the Nobel Peace Prize Award. I hadn't been on a train before, and then suddenly Sharon and Marilyn say, Mrs. Prithipal, you are one of the chaperones. And I was so excited. I came home. I could not stop talking to my husband about it. I think this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to wear. This is what we're going to pack because we're going on the peace train. And the trains were still owned by the apartheid structures. They didn't want to let you have a train that you were going to take people of different races in and that we were going to sleep together on the train. But they put up every possible barrier. There's going to be an extra charge now for bedding. And then they started with what they were going to charge for the food. We went to Kellogg and we asked for their support and they arrived with a, a truck full of those small boxes of cereal. They gave us enough cereal for 150 people to have cereal every day for the two weeks that we were on the, the trip. That was how we pieced it together. My husband could not stop taking out pictures. He said, let me just take out quite a bit of pictures of you all before we leave. And when we were at the station, it was so lovely to see family there and all sending us off. I remember pulling out of the train station. First of all, I couldn't believe it was happening. I was like, we're doing it, you know? And the kids were all screaming and everybody was shouting and screaming and carrying on because we're like, yeah! We're actually make, making this happen. It was a huge train. A blue train, a train that I used to see on TV, and it had the beds, you could sleep on the train, you could eat in the trains, and I only heard about these things you know, on TV, you've seen it on TV, but I've never been on such a train. Sharon and Marilyn, the idea of putting that together, it must have come from some corner of heaven. You know, the music therapy that I'm doing, which is what this project is about, is an enlightening and empowering experience for the kids. Whether they grow up to be first-class musicians is, is not my um, first agenda. My main feeling is that if it gives them a sense of self-worth and um, belief in themselves, that's what it's all about. And if we can help them to, to further their education and to make something out of themselves um, in their futures, that, that's what this is all about. It showed me something that I didn't know about myself. Being in a group made me believe that I can do anything I want to do in life. The first stop was Peter Maritzburg. There we were met by 
Ella Gandhi, who's Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter. Gandhi went to South Africa to help in the resistance struggle there against apartheid. He, at one point, he rode on a train and he was thrown off because he wanted to travel first class and you could only travel first class if you were white. It brought back a lot of memories because everyone just spoke about this is a place where Mahatma Gandhi was thrown off the train because he was an Indian and we were not allowed in first class. That was emotional. Because here was a man who was educated, coming to a country to fight a case, and you know, you, you have a certain dignity. Every person has this sense of dignity that you walk your life with. And to think that because of the color of your skin, you're thrown off a train. And I mean, before Gandhi, it happened to so many people. It happened to him, and he decided to do something about it. It is not without significance that our children are reminding us today that our country is torn apart. On behalf of the Gandhi 100 and all the organizations that I'm associated with, I welcome Sharon Katz to share with you their vision for peace. In the peace train, there was no first, second or third class. We all were just one. It made you think how far we had come from that time when he was thrown off to where we were in 1993, but how long more we still had to go. Because even though it was good enough for me to be riding there, the country still wasn't at a point where anybody could do what they want to. We have to admit that the situation in this country is quite dismal at this stage and we have to do whatever we can. This train teaches us that we can live together and work together without prejudices and any problems coming in the way. After the concert, we got onto our train and everybody rode first class. That was the one thing that we insisted on. I've never been in, in such a train and another thing, it's, it is a great pleasure touring South Africa singing peace because it was something that we all wished for just to spread peace at that time politically things were very bad where were you yesterday how many houses were damaged there how many houses how many houses If you remember, that was the time just before the elections the following year, 1994. Political climate was so rife. So many people were dying at the time. There were certain areas where one could not easily move in. Around Devon around uh, Claremont. We were always scared about the kids because uh, at the time the racial situation was so bad. It was so bad. Even if we get uh, threats from the people, it, it never made us uh, to be scared to continue with what we were doing. I recall where we weren't allowed to be on Anstey's beach. There was only whites allowed there. We were walking and we were holding hands with Sharon and Marilyn. And there was these people that just kept on staring at us. It was like, what is this woman trying, you know? We got these dirty looks, but in our hearts we knew, you know, this woman is actually trying to break barriers. Democracy by the stroke of a pen doesn't bring cohesion, doesn't bring social peace, does not bring harmony. And I think that in, in that respect, the peace train just gave us a phenomenal opportunity. It was quite a, a moment where you got white kids with the black kids. At the time, it was very awkward to see that happening. 
because we always regarded the white kids to be the, the better lot of the community. And our kids, the African kids, were on the lower side. From being in the peace train, it opened up a lot of doors for us. Uh, not only me, uh, even other kids that were, that were in the peace train. And from that experience, uh, the kids uh, had to choose someone who was going to be their leader. I'm talking about black, white, uh, Indian kids. And they all voted for me. And I was surprised because coming from the township, here now I'm in a position where white kids are voting for me, saying they want me to be their leader. And uh, growing, growing up in South Africa where uh, white people were always uh, in charge, uh, were supreme, uh, now you find a situation where white people are voting for a black person to be their leader. I'm Sisi Lutuli. Uh, I'm the president of the Peace Train. And that changed uh, my life and my perception about uh, white people as well. We insisted that each compartment on the trains would be a racially mixed group to look like we're now in the new South Africa. And it was a phenomenal experience. There was an atmosphere of absolute jubilance on this train. She spoke about the uh, peace train to me. When she started, it didn't make sense until I was actually involved in it. And then it started, you know, coming clear as to this is helping a lot of young kids to find a direction in life. And it was quite an experience for me and other musicians that were involved in that peace train uh, to move around South Africa talking about the wonderful things that can happen when we move together as a collective in making one community, South African community. It was a great time, a great time for me and for the children from the rural areas. You know what? It was so amazing. where I was teaching, they didn't know about the city. They didn't know about the buses going up and down, about number of cars going up and down, and they didn't, they didn't even know about the, the sea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was like a queen. Hey, I was like a queen to them because it was for the first time for them to be exposed in such a situation. It was where I needed to be. I could sing, I could dance, I could express myself. It was just a dream come true. It affected my life. I've got good memories. I can show my kids. I've got something to be proud about. Breathe in. Feel the shoulder blade. Move in. Forget you're on the train. When you're traveling on a, you know, chuk chucking on, on a train, on a journey, there's no way that you can't mix, can't see uh, each other as uh, the same as you. Everybody getting up, eating, cleaning, uh, brushing their teeth, everybody's the same and uh, it was just amazing to see that this could happen. Quickly now, down this side with your chaperones, quickly back to the train, your dinner is on the table. Eat, change into your purple shirts, and get back up on stage. Well, on the peace train, I was mother, mother to all, and I helped 
organized the children, made sure that they had what they needed, and that none of the children were lost. We all lived on this slow moving train, and the cubicles were six by nine. I was fortunate to have my own cubicle, but anything and everything that needed to be on the trip, cassettes and food and boxes and medicines was in my compartment. I climbed over many of boxes and made sure that when I slept, they didn't fall on me. The train was equipped with running water and we all got showers and a lot of the children got showers that they they lived under them because it was something they didn't have. They always got bathed under a hose spigot. One day I was missing Tanya. We'd never been apart. And yeah, she was traveling on the train and she had this long curly hair. And I was busy with something and I looked up. The whole TV screen was my child's face on the peace train. I was crying. I was trying to push the record button and it wouldn't go in and I was trying to watch her and record it and it just didn't happen. <laughs> My kid is on the train. And then when we would stop, everybody would pile out. We put up the sound system with the sound crew ourselves. Stop. I can remember uh, when we did a concert and uh, they cut the power because of non-payment. And Sharon carried on playing, you know, just with acoustic guitar and the others and the drums and so on. We carried on singing and the show goes on. Remember when we were in Port Elizabeth in 1993, I, I met the mayor of Port Elizabeth for the first time and the queen uh, from Miss Port Elizabeth. I mean, I don't normally get closer to the beauty queens, but I did in that occasion. Actually, I never performed with a multilingual band before, and this was my first opportunity. I must say that my entire vision uh, has, and outlook has changed for a brighter South Africa. I'm really, very proud to be here. Hello, Cape Town. Are you ready for the peace train? Oh, you know, the peace train has been traveling all around South Africa this month. We boarded our train in Durban with a hundred beautiful kids. You see them on the left and right. Give those kids a hand. Those kids represent all the cultures of South Africa and they've been traveling around by train with this incredible band and our very special guest, Lady Smith Black Mombazo, to spread a message of peace all around South Africa. And are we ever glad to be in Cape Town?
and as time went by, we were rehearsing for a couple of shows and stuff, and then out of the blue, they said there may be a trip to America. All of a sudden, this this little dream that I had far away was like, how oh, looks like it might be a reality. Well, it has crossed my mind the peace plane. <laughs> Disney World. And it grew into such a wonderful conflict resolution project that when they heard about it in other countries, they said if, if kids can do this in South Africa, it can be done anywhere in the world. And won't you bring a group of youth over to the United States and the Middle East? The whole township was buzzing. Everyone heard that Mcsizi uh, Tool will be going uh, overseas. Expect to have fun and enjoy also. And uh, expect it to be educational also, you know, the, not just fun, to have, find something new. I remember the principal announcing that I'll be going overseas. They actually uh, requested kids to make some few donations because I had to buy clothes. They said, no, I need to look good when I go overseas because I'll be representing my school. Other countries, especially overseas, they'll see that South Africa now is new South Africa. My name is Rose Dillon. I am the secretary of the Peace Train Youth Club. Our music is something they haven't experienced before in a way, and it'll enlighten them in a, in a sense on what we are really all about. I personally feel that it'll amaze them um, because, you know, me, it's amazed me what we can do with music. And I think they'll, they'll be almost overwhelmed by what we've achieved. on a plane for the first time. Scary to look down. <laughs> and I hope I don't get sick on the plane, homesick or anything. Because uh, on the train, I got sick at the first time. But I'm sure this time I won't get sick. I remember we flew from Devon to Joburg. And from Joburg, we flew straight to JF Kennedy. New York. We want to welcome you to America and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, your trip here is something that you'll be proud of and something you can take back to South Africa. Thank you, thank you for coming and, and have a great time while you're here. I grew up in a, uh, in a situation where you know nothing is by luck, you know what I'm saying? So I never, I never used to show excitement that there's a possibility that I may go somewhere far. I didn't even know where America was. Yes, I was excited, but at the same time I wasn't because you know you get disappointed, you know, and you're thinking, am I really in this thing or am I really not? So even until it came to the day, we left. Hey, I'm excited. So we, when we were on the plane, that's when the excitement kicked in to say, well, wow, you know what, you actually, you are so lucky. South Africa is made up of many, many millions of people and you out of so many people has made it. I'm Lenore Gosmikey. I'm born and bred um, in Sydney, Durban, South Africa. I'm Ken Goss. I'm Lenore's father. We have teachers coming with us. We have primary teachers, Nunta Tlawanda and Mr. Goss, who's a secondary teacher. It was the first time I'd ever been in the state, so it was a wonderful experience for me to be there. I tried to take in as much as I could and to be part of something as great as that. You know, because all that came with the release of uh, Nelson Mandela, and we had we went into this showing our our democracy now had come at last. It was really, really a mind blowing experience for me. to the States, mixing with other kids was just, it was normal for us because that's how Sharon and Marilyn had brought us up in the peace train. We were all treated exactly the same. Nobody was any better or any less or any, everybody was just the same. That's something that I carry towards my kids. You know, you never judge a person because of who they are and what they are. And the nice thing about it, all these things weren't forced upon us. We were all kind of 
drawn together by this musical magnet. It was actually a stepping stone for so many of the children. Most of them came from underprivileged homes. But when these kids became involved in the peace train, they could see part of another world out there. My success today is due to that. It opened up doors, it kind of gave me a spectrum in order to organize my life. Many of those kids came out of their shells in America and they blossomed there. They blossomed there. Some of them actually grew up there. We were very lucky to have a tour to USA to play in New Orleans Jazz Festival. Whoa! And I remember we performed there after the TLC. I remember it very well. To perform in the big stages with the full band, big crowds, people screaming, and then I really felt good. Oh, is this really Tulani? To see this South African group there when you've got over 40 acres that has music spread all over it and to see the crowd that gathered to just watch Peace Train was incredible to see. We're 
we're in Maximo's restaurant in New Orleans here, and um, we've just been graced with this heavenly choir. I don't <laughs> so the whole restaurant is kind of stunned. At, um, just beautiful, great ambassadors for Africa. My childhood idol, Joni Mitchell. Um, I started playing guitar when I was 11 years old, and by 12, 13, 14, I was playing all of these songs, you know, all of Joni Mitchell's repertoire. On behalf of the President and Mrs. Clinton, welcome to the White House. We're glad you had a chance to visit today. This was a special day for us. We'd like to share our, our music with them, and we'd like to invite President Clinton to perhaps practice up a little bit, and maybe he can play with us the next time we're in town. <laughs> if you go and look in my car, you will find Sharon Katz's CD. If you go and look in my wardrobe, you will find the T-shirts from the Mardi Gras. Jambalaya Jam and the uh, New Orleans Festival. I've still got the Peace Train cap. New York, seeing the, the Statue of Liberty. I've got so many good memories, traveling long hours from this city to the other. And I've only seen these uh, tall buildings on TV. Now I was actually there. overseas, then I really realized the concept of ambassador. When I sang that national anthem, that is when I got this huge lump in my throat and I thought, I love my country. And that cannot be experienced if I wasn't with the peace train. It just took on epic proportions every single time we got together. It just felt so right.
Yeah. We would always get that call. If Mandela was in town or if there was anything that was going on that was important, even before elections. Peace train, we need the peace train. Come on, peace train, we need you to come and perform. I even met uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he shook my hands and uh, uh, I was so proud. Even today, I feel blessed to be touched by that uh, great man. Through this peace train, it was really, really an amazing thing, an amazing experience that I've ever ever had in my life. We've been carrying that flame, carrying that torch of the peace train wherever we've been. We always stressed that there's a responsibility that goes along with being in the peace train. We're there to perform, yes, we're there to, to set an example, yes, but we're also there to go out into our various communities and do the work that needs to be done. It's looking good now, Sharon with the friends of the peace train, they decided to build a school, Kwangolos. And it was near to the school where we, we met. We first uh, started the project with the 500 voices. I heard so much about Sharon's work with the peace train. And I certainly was interested in the things that she was doing, being uh, a partner to an orphanage there, helping with a feeding program. The Peace Train has taught us it's important that each of us do something, whatever it is that we can to make the world a better place, each of us individually. Children dancing and singing, please tell me how. How to keep them smiling, don't want to see them cry. For as long as I live, Sharon and Marilyn will always be up there with those role models. I mean, Sharon had this talent that she could have taken and gone on a conventional path and not touched anybody's life, but enjoyed her own life. And, and she had the talent, she had the, the education to do it. But she decided to take a path that was so difficult. I mean, I, I can't understand how, how it happened. It was something that I just thought, this is not an ordinary person, rock star. These are my children. They are my heart and my soul. Whatever they do, I'm happy, even if I can help them a little bit more. I'm not just like any other kid that you see here. I come from a children's home where I don't have a mommy, I don't have a daddy. I must say it was very difficult because I did feel lonely. I just felt like I was lost, I was basically thrown away and now I have to kind of build myself, you know, from scratch. And ever since then, Sharon and Madeline have been mentors and parents to me because I didn't have those parents, you know, somebody to fill that void. I've got all the characteristics of being a street child. If you look at my life, the suffering that I've went through, I've got all those characteristics that I can qualify, I can get A for that. But I defy the odds and I just went on a different path because of my heart. You've got fathers today because of being part of the peace train. 
And not just fathers, I mean men. Youth development is a major part of the addressing of the ills of apartheid because obviously what they instituted for many, many years uh, was youth undevelopment uh, and uh, deliberately so, so that they could produce workers uh, for factories and mines rather than fully economically active, educated and developed young people. We need to keep this truth alive. It is the only cornerstone for our sanity. In order we entrench it in the minds of the young, lest we forget, lest we forget. We had one goal. We wanted to, to show South Africa that you can have people you know, of different races doing one thing and be successful. And we did that. Through all the challenges, we did that. We managed to do it. I've never seen the unity that I saw with the Peace Train group. People of one belief, one spirit, one mind. You know, just there for each and every one of them. That was probably one of the happiest times in my life. Um, as I say, so much of what I didn't even know I was and what I could be was brought out, was nurtured and developed into something so much more than what I thought I could be. The most important thing was that the children needed to be happy and we needed to carry on and we needed to grow. That's, that's so selfless, it's so selfless, thank you. That peace train, I mean, that's what this is all about, that peace train really started something, which hasn't stopped. Good South African citizens, that's all I ask. I just want decent human beings committed to goodness and giving and receiving. That's the thing that we want in life. We don't want to be selfish. All we want, we want to share, we want to show that we are social beings. We want to show that we are trying to eliminate all the social ills that we were experiencing by the time in our communities. That would be the best gift that we have achieved when we say we've created a, a one nation of South Africans. Let me sing a song for you just to say how happy I am. Sia Chabula, Sia Chabula, Sia Chabula, Sia Chabula. We have democracy, Sia Chabula. We are together now. Sia Chabula, hi Sia Chabula, eh Sia Chabula, oh Sia Chabula, Sia Chabula, oh Sia Chabula, hey Sia Chabula.